Are cryptocurrencies a scam? Maybe. Welcome back, fam. Tonight's discussion is brought to us by the Market Realist. The title of their article is Whether Bitcoin is a Ponzi Scheme. VR Finder seems to think so. So, rather than reading through the entire article, we're going to paraphrase it and just focus in on a few key points. The article highlights the viewpoints of three skeptics that would critique cryptocurrencies. The first person would be Gerard Lanier, a computer scientist, worked for Atari up until 1983, at which point he started his own company, VPL Research. Through this company, they came up with a prototype for the Nintendo Power Glove and the VR suit. Moving on, the next person was a El Salvadorian central banker. And our third person is the billionaire investor Warren Buffett, who considers cryptocurrencies such as Bitcoin, Rat Poison, Square. Okay, now that we have our three players, we can explore this idea of what a Ponzi scheme from three different perspectives. One would expect the computer scientist to view things from a systems perspective, such as the functionality of something. We also have a banker who would more than likely, his issue would be that cryptocurrencies have no centralization. There's no regulation. And he, he's got good reason to be concerned about that. And then we look at Warren Buffett. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna really explore Warren Buffett because his perspective, his track record, speaks volumes as to why one would consider uh, cryptocurrencies to be a kind of Ponzi scheme, a scam to a degree. For the purpose of this discussion, we're gonna use the term cryptocurrency as well as the names of the other kinds of cryptocurrencies such as Bitcoin, Ethereum, Doji, Ripple. We're going to use these terms interchangeably because the level of mistrust and doubt isn't just directed towards one coin as opposed to another. The level of skepticism is actually directed towards all of these currencies uh, when people are on the fence concerning the legitimacy of these currencies. So what's a cryptocurrency? In its truest sense, cryptocurrencies are systems that allow for secure payments online, which are denominated in terms of virtual tokens. These coins are considered tokens, right? A cryptocurrency is a form of a digital asset based on a network that is distributed across a large number of computers. This decentralized structure allows it to exist outside of the control of governments. We're not gonna go into what a blockchain is. We're not gonna go into what a ledger is. That's irrelevant in this discussion. So how do you purchase the currency? You purchase it through a cryptocurrency exchanger. Uh, like Coinbase, Cash App, I think Robinhood does it now. So how does cryptocurrencies make money? You make money with them either by mining the coin, selling the coin, or facilitating the transactions. So there we have it. That's cryptocurrency in a nutshell. So what's a Ponzi scheme, right? A Ponzi scheme is when you pay old investors with new investor money. There's indications that you might be a part of a Ponzi scheme if the investment return has little to no risk and the investments are unregistered. They're not registered with the SEC and there's no regulatory body involved in that. That's how come some people cast doubt and disbelief on cryptocurrencies because there's no regulation. There's other reasons why people see these uh, currencies as, as a kind of scam. Uh, I think the main reason floating around out here is what good is this currency when the power goes out, right? Because it's a digital asset, okay? You can't really put it in your pocket and walk to the grocery store. No, when the power goes out, it disappears until the power comes back, okay? And even though it's uh, encrypted, even though cryptography does play a role in legitimizing these transactions they're not impervious to hacking okay there's been numerous uh, reports of hacking whether it be the coins themselves through a 51 percent attack or someone has actually gone after the crypto wallets so now that we have that established we know that a cryptocurrency is a digital asset 
that has value. And we also know that a Ponzi scheme is when you pay old investors with new investor money. And a Ponzi scheme, uh, just to add a little bit more, and a Ponzi scheme is only as good as there are more investors to enter the scheme. The moment the scheme runs out of uh, new money, it falls apart. In our discussion up until this point, we have a surface level understanding of what a cryptocurrency is and a Ponzi scheme is. We have also identified our would-be antagonists in our discussion, uh, the players, the actors, the counterbalance to the legitimacy of these cryptocurrencies, the naysayers. Where does that leave us, right? Absolutely nowhere. Odds are, <laughs> odds are we probably already knew these things to begin with. In order for us to move forward in this conversation, we have to put ourselves inside of the shoes of a would-be investor. And to that end, I've come up with four different character types that would help us piece together the puzzle as to whether this is a good investment or not. And if I haven't said this before, uh, I'm not a lawyer and I don't play one on TV. I'm not a tax guy. I'm not a, you know, a stock guy. I'm just a guy who learns about where he's going to put his money. So the first guy I came up, the first character type is a curious character type, right? What sort of person is this? So the curious investor type would be the kind of person, sort of a unique person, right? They got into a cryptocurrency because of maybe personal reasons, beliefs, or maybe they were just trying something new. Odds are they may have been gifted cryptocurrency to begin with, like John Radcliffe. He was gifted $10 in Bitcoin. He saw the value in the Bitcoin. Then he took out a $150,000 loan to purchase 150 coins. Now the man's a millionaire having his new home built and he's waiting on this new Tesla. Okay, so he took a risk. Some people would consider this man a trailblazer. He saw the value of it and he jumped right in. Okay, the next sort of investor the next sort of would-be crypto investor would be the convinced character type. This sort of person, this sort of would-be crypto investor, isn't really an investor at all to begin with. Uh, this person was convinced to get into the crypto game. Right? If you can imagine, you're online and you're uh, searching for a sell on a nice jacket. You go to Amazon.com, you see a nice jacket. You think to yourself, this is, a, this is a great item, but I'm not really gonna spend any money on this just yet. I'm gonna shop around. So then maybe you go to Target, right? <laughs> you go to the, the rich man's Walmart, right? You go to Target.com and you search for another jacket. Something happened just then, but you really didn't pick it up, right? So, so you go about your day, you've completely forgot about the jacket. But somehow when you're checking your Facebook or your Instagram or any other of your social media outlets, right? Somehow there's another jacket that's being advertised to you. And in some cases, it's the jacket that you saw a couple of days ago. It's the jacket that caught your eye, but you weren't really ready to pull the trigger on the purchase just yet. So you don't think nothing of it. You think it's just weird. You go a little bit more and then there's another advertisement for the same jacket. What the hell is happening here? Everybody knows what's happening here. There's an algorithm that keeps track of what your ideas are, what you're more than likely gonna purchase. And even if you didn't make the purchase on that particular item, these sales algorithms, they will sometimes even offer you something similar or something that's more affordable. Same thing happens with cryptocurrencies, right? People who are you know, just dipping their toe into what a cryptocurrency is what Bitcoin is, what Doji, Shiba, any of that mess, right? You look at a few articles and suddenly you're being bombarded with how well these digital currencies are doing. You're being inundated with uh, information as to how much people are making off of it, how billionaires are cropping out of the woodwork. But even still, you might be sitting on the fence. You know, how can I get into the crypto game? Bitcoin's at 60K right now. I can't afford that. Am I gonna take another loan out of my home just to afford this mess? No, you don't have to. In fact, 
There's some sites that will even pitch you the idea of a more affordable kind of way to purchase uh, cryptocurrencies. Like if you wanted to get into the big ones. Case in point, a Satoshi. Right? What's a Satoshi? You might be asking yourself. A Satoshi is a millionth of a Bitcoin. Grossly affordable at that point. Pennies on the dollar even. You get enough of these things and suddenly you'll have a Bitcoin in its entirety. Okay? So, here at CoinMama.com, we can see just how affordable and just how low the buy-in could be to get into the Bitcoin game. But what's most important on this screen is what's at the very bottom of it. Why do we need cookies? According to this screen, according to what they would convey to a would-be visitor of their site, we use cookies to personalize content, to provide social media features, and to analyze our traffic as well as to authenticate your access. So what's a cookie? Uh, <laughs> it's not just uh, a delicious cylindrical pastry meant for rapid consumption <laughs> by small people. A cookie, such as a HTTP cookie, are small blocks of data created by a web server while a user is browsing a website. So the site that you visit created the cookie. That's very important because there's different kinds of cookies. If we go down further on Wikipedia, wikipedia.com, we can see that there's a session cookie, a persistent cookie, which also goes by a tracking cookie. It's very important because these cookies are stored in your browser, on your computer, on your phone, on your laptop, whatever. And who knows how many different sites can access the cookies stored on your phone. It is a stored cookie of the cryptocurrency you had your eye on that is generating these advertisements that are directed towards you. And hell man, it's even <laughs> the, the tracking cookies that kept track of the nice jacket you were looking for earlier. Why is that important? This is important because at one point you were just sitting on the fence as to whether you're gonna purchase this stuff or not. Through the use of these cookies and through the implementation of an algorithm, suddenly you're getting articles and advertisements of cryptocurrencies. Suddenly, you may be convinced that the speculation around these currencies are actually true that there is value, that there is money to be made in cryptocurrency, all because you showed some interest in the first place and the algorithm wants to sell you this based on your browser history. At some point, you may have even been convinced. So we have our curious, we have our convinced. Let's move on to the calculating type. Up until this point, the curious investor, as well as the convinced investor, have gotten into Bitcoin uh, with the assumption of either buying and selling cryptocurrencies, such as buy low and sell high, as with the regular stock market. They're either using that method or they're simply mining the coins themselves. Okay, so what's mining? Mining is the validation of transactions to be added to the blockchain, the ledger. Okay, it's also a method for distributing new coins. So how does mining distribute new coins? Or more so, how does mining create new coins? Okay, new coins are created through the block reward system that's inherent in these currencies. Miners are rewarded for finding a new block. A block reward is the incentive for miners to mine, right? It's like you're being paid to perform the service, right? You're being paid to validate the transaction, which will be the finding of a new block to be added to the ledger and you're paid in this incentive the current block reward is six and a quarter bitcoin and currently at the time of this recording bitcoin was at 60k so six bitcoin times 60k that's what that, that that's a lot of money right that's a lot of money so how many coins have already been mined and are there any left to be mined so according to Buy Bitcoin Worldwide, a little under 20 million Bitcoin are currently in existence with somewhere around 2 million remaining to be mined. And with an average of 900 coins mined a day, 
certainly one might get themselves involved in something like this, right? Maybe you're you're one of those lucky individuals that actually validates the entire block broadcast it to the rest of the computers and then suddenly you're rewarded with this massive wealth but the game isn't like that there's other people there's groups of people and there's so many businesses built around crypto can you even compete hell man is your internet even fast enough <laughs> is that is that 10 year old laptop with the commodore 64 modem does it have enough power to crunch these numbers Probably not, right? So, now that we know how the would-be curious and convinced investor, how they may get themselves involved with just mining the transactions or just outright buying and selling them like everybody else on the planet, let's look into how the calculated crypto investor might get themselves involved. And for that, let's take another step back and look at Warren Buffett. Currently, Warren Buffett has $104 billion, right? He's a rich man. How did he make his money? Warren Buffett, uh, as I said earlier, he considers cryptocurrencies rat poison square. So, again I ask, like, how does Warren Buffett make his money? Warren Buffett makes his money by investing in performance. How does one invest in performance, right? Warren Buffett invests his money in companies that perform well. And he just doesn't invest his money in, in this particular fashion. He, he invests his money with the aims of taking over these companies by becoming a 51% shareholder. He uses the company he founded, Berkshire Hathaway, which has an equity value of $348 billion. He uses that to purchase stocks in these other companies. Companies like Bank of America, Apple, Coca-Cola, Verizon, Kroger, you know, these everyday names. You walk out your door, you've heard of these companies. These companies have been around for a long time because they perform well. So how did Warren Buffett actually get started in investing? Warren Buffett has gone on record and saying he leverages his money with other people's money. He didn't just spend his own money. He would actually go into deals with people who made more money than him. He would go out and find these deals, talk to his richer friends at the time, and ask them if they wanted to go in on the deal with him, and then they would just share the profits. So at the start of Warren Buffett's career, he was, he was, ba <laughs> he was basically a middleman, and he used that to his advantage. So Warren Buffett does not own crypto, but what he does own is multiple stakes in good performing companies. So how can we translate what Warren Buffett does into the calculating crypto investor type. It's my assertion that this particular person doesn't invest in crypto outright like the rest of us would. The calculating crypto investor invests in the transactions. This sort of person does not look at how much Bitcoin is worth, how much Dogecoin is worth, or how much any of these popular currencies are. That's irrelevant to this sort of person. What is important to this kind of investor is the amount of transactions that take place. It's just like going to the grocery store every time you buy a loaf of gallon. <laughs> every time a loaf of gallon. It's like every time you go to the grocery store and you buy a loaf of bread or maybe a dozen eggs or maybe a gallon of milk. Anything you buy at the store is gonna come with a tax. Imagine if that were to happen to these cryptocurrencies, right? Imagine. And for a second, let's look at the performance, the amount of traffic, the amount of transactions that some of these currencies actually produce. So if we were to visit bitinfocharge.com, we could actually see the amount of transactions that some of the most popular currencies generate. We can see that Bitcoin has over 200,000 transactions per day. We can see that Dogecoin has 26,000 transactions on average. And then we can see something very interesting. We can see that XRP has over 2 million blockchain transactions per day. It's at this point in this discussion where the rubber starts to meet the road, right? Where we actually start to see some funny business that goes on with these cryptocurrencies. And we will start to see things from 
the naysayers, how this thing could be considered a Ponzi scheme or at, at the least bit a scam. So what's Ripple and how does it stand aside? How does it set itself aside from the other cryptocurrencies? According to Investopia, Ripple is a technology that acts both as a cryptocurrency and a digital payment network for financial transactions. Ripple's main process is a payment settlement asset exchange and remittance system, similar to the SWIFT system for the international money and security transfers, which is used by banks for dealing across currencies. Ripple operates as an open source and peer-to-peer -peer decentralized platform that allows for seamless transfer of money in any form, whether it's dollars, yen, euros, or cryptocurrencies. Why is this important? It's important because the utility of the currency, the utility of this particular crypto is different than the rest of them. I believe I made reference to the utility of these coins, right? What is the use of them? And if you go to an article by AP News, El Salvador makes Bitcoin legal tender. They made it legal tender because the majority of money in El Salvador actually comes from outside of the country. According to the article, the economy ministry noted that 70% of El Salvadorians do not have access to traditional financial services, and it said that the company needs to authorize the circulation of digital currency whose value exclusively follows free market criteria to stimulate growth. El Salvadorians receive some $6 billion in remittances from El Salvadorians living abroad last year, about 16% of the country's GDP. Bitcoin could eliminate the cost of sending that money home. Yeah, through the use of Bitcoin and currencies like it, like the article said, 16% of the country's GDP actually comes from outside of the country. For those who don't know, a remittance is just sending money to someone overseas. That, that becomes important when Bitcoin is used in this particular fashion. It's not just used to make money, it's actually saving the country money. It's saving the citizens money. How does Ripple fit into that, right? It's used to facilitate transactions for a seamless transfer of money in any form. Transfer in this sense would be the conversion from one currency to another, whether it's dollars, yen, euros, cryptos, whatever. There's actual utility when it comes to these coins when they're used in this fashion. But if we go deeper into uh, Ripple, actually Ripple was first released in 2012 by Chris Larson and Jeb McCaleb. Chris Larson is worth an estimated $6 billion, but with his co-founder, Jeb McCaleb worth $3 billion. So, if we dig a little deeper into Jed, we, we start to get a clearer picture of the skepticism behind these currencies. Yeah, if we look at a five-year NASDAQ graph for XRP, we can see that it was practically pennies on the dollar in 2020. But sometime around mid-2021, the value of it spiked tremendously. And currently, XRP, Ripple, is sitting somewhere around a dollar. You gotta keep these in mind. We just didn't see this with XRP. We also saw the same spikes in Bitcoin, and we also saw the same thing with Dogecoin. Sometime around May, May or March in 2021, these things just exploded. What caused the value of these things to explode? What, what caused the value to suddenly explode? It isn't like you can just dump one of these coins onto the market and then suddenly people immediately see the value of it. That just doesn't happen. Most investors are really skeptical, you know, investing their money in anything. Just like with Warren Buffett, good investors tend to invest in performance. So what happened somewhere around this time frame in March and May? What happened during this time frame was the increased coverage of cryptocurrencies. If you can think back to earlier when we discussed the convinced investor, how this person looked at one or two articles and then suddenly was inundated with countless articles of maybe crypto or maybe nice jackets, right? Suddenly he gets flooded with these articles and then he starts to think, hey man, maybe there's something to this. 
And then we get people like Elon Musk and Mark Cuban always in the news for some reason over what they think about these coins. Quite a few people seem to think that these, these are gods among men. You know, if they have an interest, surely there's something to it. So people start to buy into it, right? People start to think, maybe there's something to this. Maybe I should put my money here. Maybe this is a good investment. When in actuality, this is still a digital asset that holds no value. So let's get back onto what the calculated investor invests in when it comes to crypto. Again, they invest in the transactions. And if we go back and look at how many transactions XRP engages in, at one point in time, it was 2 million transactions a day. The importance of this number becomes apparent when we assign a dollar value to each transaction. Let's say there's a $1 transaction fee for every XRP transaction, regardless of its size. Let's say that. Your math would ultimately lead you to, hey man, in one day, this currency may have generated somewhere around $2 million. $2 million just translating money from one form to another. That's impressive, right? That's what the calculated investor would look at, right? That's where they put their money in. They just don't put it into the coin itself. They put it into the company behind the coin or the company that facilitates the coin. It's use, like Coinbase, Robinhood, whatever. This leads us into the fourth kind of crypto uh, investor. The fourth kind of crypto character type. I haven't come up with a, a polite name for this kind of person. I'm just gonna leave it at uh, the other kind, right? This sort of investor operates in the gray areas. Gray areas in the sense that there's some distrust that went along with their involvement in the currency. Sticking with XRP, Ripple, we're gonna look further into Jeb McCaleb. Mr. McCaleb is worth an estimated $3 billion, which is impressive, right? $3 billion is very much impressive. Just a little bit of info about Mr. McCaleb. Mr. McCaleb is a programmer at heart. He helped co-found Ripple in 2012. Why is this important, right? Mr. McCaleb's wealth comes from an estimated 3.4 billion XRP he still holds. From the original 9 billion XRP he pocketed as a Ripple founder. That's impressive, right? You should be asking yourself, how was this man able to afford that amount of XRP, even though when it was initially created, it was worth practically nothing? How was it that this man was able to amass so much of a currency that for the most part hadn't even been mined to that extent? We, we can find our own answer when we look at an article from Crypto News, right? What's XRP and Ripple? In the article, they make mention that a total of 100 billion XRP was pre-mined at launch. So, what's pre-mining? Like I said, it's gonna start to get gray. It ain't gonna be pretty going forward. So, pre-mining is the act of mining coins before the cryptocurrency is launched to the public. Okay, pre-mining is associated with ICOs as a way to reward founders, developers, or early investors in the project. At this point, we get to draw a comparison between our uh, Gerard Lanier, our computer scientist from earlier who says that the uh, cryptos are a scam or a Ponzi scheme. We get to draw a comparison between him and Mr. Jeb McKayla, a programmer. A programmer, a programmer who had a hand in creating a currency that had no value, but somehow has exploded in value due to its use and utility. It's exploded in value, and because he was paid in this amount, all he had to do is just sit on it and let the value go up. So using that idea, using that mental framework, that possibility that let's create something and let everybody else give it value, let's add, let's add substance to our other crypto investor type. Right? They don't necessarily invest in the coin themselves. They invest around the coin. They invest in performance. Yeah, so how does the other investor type play the crypto game? 
they create their own. They create their own coins, their own tokens, dump them onto the market, generate buzz around them, right? Either through social media or through exploiting the news themselves, you know, because everybody wants to be the first to know about any old thing in this world. The speed of news is just ridiculous these days. Everybody wants to be the first to report on something. And what happens is people end up with the, you know, with the wool pulled over their eyes, right? And the rug pulled from underneath them. So how does the other investor do this? Well, they get a couple of developers or maybe they themselves are developers. They take the source code from one coin, maybe Bitcoin, and then they clone that particular source code, you know, changing a few values. They take that source code, clone it, change a few values, pre-mine a certain amount of it, then release it to the public. They let the public speculation drive up the price, and then they dump all their pre-mined coins in the future. A couple of hours of coding nowadays can generate billions of dollars in profits. That, that, that's freakishly amazing. And when it's looked at in this sense, are cryptocurrencies still a scam? Right? Hey, could it be considered something of a Ponzi scheme? No. No. It, it, it's not even a scam. And it's not even a Ponzi scheme. It operates very much the same as the stock market. Well, some people will invest in value. Some people will invest in necessity. Some people will invest in performance. So when some folks say, you know, these cryptocurrencies are a scam, could it be that you just don't understand it? And it's your lack of understanding that caused you to make a bad decision, right? Who the hell invests in something that doesn't exist in the first place? You might as well get volcano insurance, right? <laughs> you, might, you might as well get volcano insurance and headbutt insurance, right? You never know when you're going to need it. What happens when a volcano comes through? I mean, you know, you never know. Right? So it's not even a scam. It's just that the understanding of these things is poorly communicated. We can see examples of this with the rise and fall of Squid Coin. Yeah, in an article by CBS News, Squid Game crypto coin promoters vanished with investor millions in rug pool scam. That's amazing. That's amazing. What led people to invest their money in Squid Coin in the first place? I would imagine it's because of the hype that was around the Squid Game uh, Netflix series. Maybe people invested their money, they thought it might be something fun to do. Or maybe they thought this could be the next big thing, and somehow they lost millions, right? What's a rug pull, you might be asking yourself. A rug pull operates in the same sense as a pump and dump. A pump and dump is a manipulative scheme that attempts to boost the price of the stock or security through fake recommendations. Now, this didn't happen with Squid Game. People just wanted to invest in Squid Coin. Well, I would imagine they didn't fully understand what a cryptocurrency is. They just wanted to be among the first to get involved because they saw how the value of it kept going up so quickly and they wanted they wanted to get in low so that they could sell high just like with your regular stock market according to the article on october 28 2021 it was a penny per token but then shortly after that it skyrocketed to two thousand eight hundred and sixty one dollars per token if we were to look at marketcap.com for squid game the squid token it's worth 12 cents on the dollar now like, what the hell happened? <laughs> so, oh my God. So, so, like when you go ahead and you throw your money out the damn window like this, you deserve to be punished. You deserve to be punished. So just to explain the rug pull a little bit further, it, it, it's just when your money gets tied up and then suddenly you realize you're not getting your money back and that whoever had your money has disappeared. Same thing happened with Squid Coin. Same thing happens with countless other cryptos that show up on the market. We've already discussed the blueprint on how to make your own. So when people get scammed, when people get uh, taken advantage of, the, of stuff like this, this is no different than anything, than any other scam that has happened in the past or will have ever happened in the future. 
a person is promised something with nothing to back it up. You were promised wealth. You were promised immediate gains, a meteoric rise in price. But somehow, that didn't happen. It's probably because you didn't understand the game you were playing. You didn't understand the mechanics of it. And now you think you've been scammed or you think that the, the pool is tainted. It's no different than se- <laughs> it's no different than selling a car that has no engine on Craigslist. If you never pop the hood, how do you know that thing drives or not? And that's where we uh, that's where we end our discussion. You know, are cryptos a scam? A Ponzi scheme? No, it's not. Money from new investors does not immediately or directly reach the hands of the old investors. The value of it operates in the same sense as the traditional stock market. Uh, how would one explain the, the rapid increase and decrease in cost and the value of these currencies? You could just attribute that to the speed of information and the susceptibility of investors to speculation. Nothing more. Right. And that'll do it. Thanks for joining us. I found this to be very interesting. If you managed to stick around to the end, yeah, just go ahead and hit that subscribe button and uh, hit the like button. Be sure to share this with your friends who are involved in these sorts of things or who would like to be involved. There's always some risk to be gained in any sort of venture. But the more information you have going in, uh, the better. All right. Don't invest in speculation. Invest in performance. Okay? Peace.